So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce my friend um, and author and speaker, Nilifer. Um, Nilifer and I met um, about seven years ago at TED in Europe. Um, and when I moved to the Bay Area, she said, oh, look me up. And I thought that's the kind of thing that Americans say when you move to the Bay Area. But when I called her up, um, she said, absolutely, I'm going to throw a dinner party for you. And she threw a dinner party for me with 10 women who then became friends and were sort of like the beginning of my, my friends and my network in the Bay Area. So I've been eternally grateful for that. Um, she also introduced me to the concept of walk, walking meetings instead of sitting meetings, which absolutely transformed my life. So I've been pacing around Mountain View ever since. Um, so, and that's actually like her super top rated TED talk is a very short talk about um, how walking is important because otherwise sitting is the smoking of our generation. So um, she's written um, on a whole number of topics and um, it's great to have her here to talk to us about her uh, latest book, which is called The Power of Onlyness, um, which is, and she'll obviously tell you much more about this concept and why she came up with it, but it's basically about how each of us is unique in their own right. Um, she's drawn from a whole load of different examples of people she's interviewed for the book, but also from her sort of own experience of working at companies like Adobe and Apple, as well as startups in the in the early days. So she's got this sort of like really kind of um, very wide career. And um, she is now a recognized thinker. And she just told me that she's now like ranked on the number uh, as number 22 on the top management thinker list. So well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, I'm going to hand it over to you to try and make these slides work or just tell you, tell <laughs> us about your ideas. Dance, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Obi. Um, so thank you for coming and actually for all your patience through the last few minutes. And uh, what I want to just do is share with you a thesis about how the world can and should be. And it starts with something really simple. I don't know if you guys have caught this, but in the economist world right now, there's a conversation going on about ideas. We've run out of ideas and therefore productivity and prosperity is doomed because specifically America has run out of ideas. And I don't know about you, but I find that idea ridiculous because actually my experience is just the opposite. I bet yours is too. Most ideas are dismissed, not because they're considered and evaluated and de deemed unworthy, but because of the packaging that the idea comes in. So if that person's super young, or maybe a woman in a male-dominated culture, or a person of color in a mostly white culture, or, and fill out the list however you choose to, most ideas are dismissed because the person who brings it lacks power and status. This problem that we have about ideas being gone is so fundamental to our economy. It's so fundamental to our future. It's because ideas, when we give them rain, pull us into the future. And so if we don't have ideas, we have nothing. And so here at Google, we know how ludicrous that idea is, but we actually have to figure out how to change the very framework by which we evaluate ideas in order for us to change the world and ultimately change our ability to create the future. Now, one of the people, so I, I, Obi mentioned that I did a bunch of research. I actually studied 300 examples in order to actually write this book. I didn't mean to write have to study 300 examples, but every single person I was studying to understand how did they get their idea through had a different idea of what made them successful than what was actually true. So there was no repeatable pattern until I studied 300, until I found the through line. And one of those stories is Franklin Leonard. Franklin started an organization called The Blacklist, which reinvented Hollywood. But when he actually showed up, he was this young, 20-something years old guy. He had worked for a congressman. He had worked at McKinsey and gotten fired. And then he showed up at Hollywood after, get this, he had done a weekend of Netflix binge watching and realized the only thing he'd ever really loved was storytelling and movies. And so he thought, I'll just show up in Hollywood and figure out how to break in. So he schlepped coffee. And one of the jobs that junior people do is to actually read scripts. And he found most of the scripts had these really trite, um, storylines that just kind of repeated the same heroic architecture and didn't reflect the stories that he wanted to see in the world. And at one point he thought there's got to be a different way. So he went through his entire Rolodex of people he had met in the last year and literally like went through and said, oh, I saw this person for lunch and I saw this person for dinner and organized an 89% email list under an alias 
Google, and uh, actually sent out a note saying, if you share with me the movies you've seen in the last year that you've loved but haven't been put into production, excuse me, screen, screen like scripts, not movies, I will collate all that up using his McKinsey skills and I will send it back to you. So that's the give and the get, do that and let's see where it goes. And people cooperated, in fact, they shared it with friends. And he ended up doing this tabulation process only because he wanted to find the scripts his boss would need. And the reason he used an alias is because he didn't want his boss to think he wasn't good at his job. So he does this, he, this is back in the days when we actually all went on vacation and actually logged off. So he printed off the top five that he got from the master list, took off. He comes back two weeks later and his inbox is full of this roll up list, this black list, all sent back to him saying, this is the most amazing list of scripts. We should all be taking a look at it. And so literally hundreds of emails are in his inbox because no one knows it's him that has started this process. Now, if it was a build, <laughs> you'd see that some of the movies that have been put into production because of the blacklist are Juno and um, The King's Speech, who would imagine, right? And so these were these scripts that were destined for the dustbin and pulled out and put back on the master list of we should really consider these odd ducky stories, Moonlight. One of the things that Franklin did is he asked a brand new question. And I said it in, in such a quick way when I first rolled out, what did he ask his people that it's worth kind of pausing on. He asked, what movies do you love that haven't been put into production? What scripts do you love? And the reality is that's not how Hollywood has been formatted up to this point. What's Hollywood sort on? What will make us money? And by doing it through an alias, he actually found a community of people who cared about the same question as that a different kind of purpose, pulling people together. And it provided enough anonymity that people could essentially vote the way their heart felt, not vote the way their boss might want them to vote. And so it changed an axis of orientation. And one of the things that shows us is really the power of community in that process, right? So often we, we think about power, the ability to get things done as personal. And so we'll often describe like, if Franklin in fact gets featured in like Fast Company and stuff as the guy, as you know, he changed Hollywood because he produced the blacklist. And it's a singular hero that is carved out as if it's not in context to all the other people who participated. And so surely he had grit and surely he asked a brand new question and surely he did absolutely an amazing set of things. But the thing that actually made the blacklist powerful to get that effort done is a social act, a communal act. And that's, not, that's community in a different way than let's say how Facebook used it. Facebook uses the term community as a group of people that we can then monetize. That's not actual community, right? Community is a group of people who are held together by a shared of beliefs, a shared set of purposes, and then together they can do things in a meaningful way. This is important also because I think it changes how we might think about how we conceive of our work. Instead of thinking, what can I do? You start to think, who can I organize around a new question? And if you walk away with nothing else other than that vignette and that story, it might change how we think and conceive of how we gather power in our lives. Because if the story's always a singular hero on top of a magazine cover, we miss the real point. That's individuating something that is deeply connected. Now, most of us lack that connection, that ability to kind of think about what is it that gives me meaning. In fact, 61% of us, the data says, cover or hide ourselves at work. Covering being defined as we actually don't show up as our true selves. It's the, some of the vignettes in the, in the research. Some, uh, a guy wearing glasses because he didn't want to look young. A young man who didn't talk about how he wanted to be a co-parent because he didn't want his colleagues to think he wasn't interested in his career, and so on and so on. What was most surprising about that detail, that 61% of us cover or hide ourselves at work, is that it didn't just affect traditional groups of underserved and underseen people. 45%, nearly half of straight white men also say they cover, which makes sense if you think about all the different ways in which people believe they have to fit to an archetype or some mirage of normal in order to actually fit in at work. And as long as we're fitting in that way, we're not actually being our true selves. And from that place of true self is where we understand what gives us meaning, what gives us purpose, and what things we actually care about, therefore the genesis of our ideas. Now, this lack of social standing when we show up at work, fitting in is the greatest barrier to belonging. 
When we lack that ability to belong as our true selves, we also lack the ability to generate ideas that we care about. I was talking with a, a banking executive not so long ago, and, and this woman was saying she had a really innovative idea for how to change the low end of the market, how to serve the, the deep poor, the people who use those cash and carry kind of places where the check cashing places are used. They typically take between 5 and 10% of that check. And she said she had a way for her bank to serve that marketplace with less than half a percent. And I was like, oh my god, that would change. You could get a whole bunch of new customers, and it would change an entire uh, group of people's lives, right? And she says, yeah, yeah, but I'll never tell the people sitting at this table. And I looked at her with that sort of tilt in my head, and I thought, why would you not say it? Why would you not own it? And it wasn't hard to think about for a second. She sat there and she said, yeah, that person, that person has an Hermes bag. That person has a such and such tie. And she said, all these people have wealthy backgrounds. And she didn't ever want to show that she didn't have that same background, because what was she doing? She was fitting in in order to belong. And as long as she was fitting in in order to belong in that half soul kind of way, she was never also going to claim that thing that was true for her, her history and experience, her own visions and hopes based on that history and experience. Without social standing, we lack the ability to actually create change, real change, the change we actually want to see in the world. Now, um, I've written, Obi alluded to it, I've written two books before on collaborative work and how power should be distributed within organizations. So basically talking about flat organizations and breaking down the perimeter of organizations to open up innovation. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, you've studied these business models for years, you've done innovation for years, this must be why you care. And actually, the real reason of why I noticed this grouping problem is because of my own heritage. You see, when I was 18 years old, I was actually supposed to get an arranged marriage. And uh, uh, I had returned home, in fact, uh, when I was 18. I'd gone to community college and for the day and returned home. And there, my aunties and uncles and stuff had filled the house. And if you know Indian families, they're just like all over the place. And uh, they had uh, been there to tell me that my arranged marriage was, well, arranged. And uh, the sort of terms of the deal were set. And I had turned to my uncle, who was sort of representing, because my father wasn't in the picture, who was representing me and or representing our family, and said, so did you ask the guy? if I could get an education, because that was the only thing I had ever said. If you could please make sure that was taken care of, I would be OK with it. Because ever since I was four and a half and moved to this country, I understood my job to be that of taking care of my mother and getting this arranged marriage as a way of serving the family. And my uncle had turned to me and said, no, she won't let me ask because she's negotiating for a house and some other things, so her future is taken care of. She doesn't want to also ask for your needs and interests. So I was polite enough to wait until my aunt, aunties and uncles left. And then I turned to her and uh, my mother, and I had done this sort of theatrical thing, which is not my style normally. Um, and I had, I had gone to Future Business Leaders of America, so the sentence is entirely informed by Future Business Leaders of America Club in high school. And I said, I am the product. You cannot do the deal without me. So ask the guy if I can get an education, and this will be done. And I had turned like the closest thing next to me, a cardboard box without a lid or anything, like grocery box. And I grabbed it, and I had put in five books in one outfit, no toothbrush, no money, because I didn't have any. And you can tell my priorities, right? Books, one outfit. And I was just doing this theatrical thing of, and I'm leaving unless you change your mind. And um, I actually thought this would end in about an hour. And so I walked down the street to the local donut shop, as one does, carbohydrates, everything. And uh, I thought I was just going to wait it out and then call home and be like, it's done. When I called home, the situation only escalated, like, we're never going to change our mind, but you come home right now. And one day turned into two, two days turned into three, and it's, well, it's been 30 years. And I got exited from my family homeless, uneducated, um, no cash in the pocket kind of thing, to go off and figure out this new direction in my life. And in that moment, my identity was being defined, my value to the world, my ability to create my own space in the world was being defined by what? A group I belonged to. In this case, being an Indian or Muslim or woman, so I'm combination thereof, <laughs> that said, the only value you have to us in the world is to serve 
in this way, in this box. That was the first time I saw groupings. And I thought, well, it's probably true to my family. But then I would go on and do, um, one of my first jobs was as an admin at Apple. And uh, I showed up in one of those like early meetings. You know, I was such a like eager kid to want to prove myself and stuff. And, uh, and one time they said, hey, we're going to brainstorm about X. Come to the meeting. We're going to do this. And I remember doing all the research I could find and formulating questions and showing up and being so excited. Like, you can totally picture it, right? Like, we're sort of like, yay. And uh, it only took a minute or two, maybe even three, to realize no one was making eye contact with me. Because it turns out in that room, it was the MBAs who had the ability to qualify for having ideas, seeing through that category not for everyone. In later jobs, it would be engineers were the people we expected to have ideas, not marketing people. Obi, you might recognize that one. Or in other jobs, it's only the top executive management team is allowed to have ideas, not this other group. And so this thing about groupings ended up showing up throughout my career in tech, throughout all the different ways in which I was driving strategy and innovation, and realizing that's actually the biggest limiting factor is that we're not noticing the one thing that actually counts, the individual that's standing right in front of us, invisible to some, but purely able to offer that perspective, that idea that they have. Sometimes they're invisible to themselves. I'm not suggesting it's just external. But it is denying the power of the singular voice and making invisible that which has value simply because of the packaging, not because of the idea. So I'll fast forward and just point out that this is actually a trend that allows us to do innovation, right? So Apple and Google helped change the mobile marketplace. I was around back when companies like Apple or Samsung used to actually choose, the, app, the term was choosing on deck, which apps they would provide one or two or three apps, costing about a million to $2 million in development, probably about the same in sales and marketing expense. And those companies would then decide, choose for the consumer, here's the thing they would offer. And Apple came along and changed that developer platform so it only cost $10,000 to be able to participate in that ecosystem, allowing a marketplace of ideas to happen in the form of apps. And then Google came along and did it one better, always, and, uh, and dropped it down to 500 bucks and change this opportunity for people to come from anywhere, everywhere, and be able to participate. And when I started spotting that, I was like, is that a pattern that would allow a whole bunch of people to suddenly become available in the marketplace of ideas? Could that idea transpose the immediate of a smartphone app or a platform-based model? And that's when I had actually coined this term, onlyness. It's part of a Essentially, it's an economic thesis, right? It's basically arguing that value can come from anywhere. Ideas come from that spot in the world that each of us stand. They can now scale in connectedness. So you can see the two parts, only knows. I should not go into marketing. And, uh, but I was basically arguing this is the way in which we will create value in the future. Now, I still believe this. Oh, the bill's not going to work. Um, but it's a really pretty build. Um, the, uh, the opportunity for each of us to finally get a chance to actually stand more deeply in our own truth and, like Franklin, be able to ask new questions of our workforce, of our work environment, and even outside that. It could change not only what we individually do, but what we're able to create together. I think to those economists who say we've run out of ideas I think they've only counted about 30-some percent of the ideas, the ideas that come from traditional power base, which in America is mostly white and mostly male, and mostly from places that sound like Harvard, when they could actually come from each and every single one of us. In fact, if I could ask you to do one little exercise with me, close your eyes for a second, and think back to that time when you first were valued just as yourself. Somebody saw you and said, this is who you are, and it's special. Or this is what you can do, and that's good. They saw some light in you, some shining capacity, and wanted that to come forward. 
Imagine now if everyone was given that same idea. Open. I think that's the power of what we can do next. That each of us, as we stand in that spot in the world only we stand in, we can be re deeply rooted in our purpose. And as we do that, it will help us find the people who care about the same things as we do. And as we do that, we end up being able to actually shape the world around us. To not just include those opinions that are currently heard, but the set of opinions that are everywhere that can shape, reshape the world to include all of our voices in a much more equal and fair way. And also, of course, allow us the power to innovate. So that's what I came to say and share. And the rest of the time is really just about um, a chance to do Q&A. And Obi can come and she probably even has a question knowing her. Um, but we'll pass along the mic to um, You can ask anything from what's it like to write a book? Some people like to ask that question uh, to go. Excellent. So just put your hand up and I'll pass you the, light, um, the mic so that people can hear it. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a question. So one of the things that in, uh, intrigued me about onlyness and this sort of um, relationship between the individual and the groups is that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, um, we often talk about specific groups, right? Like women or gay people, et cetera. Right. And as we kind of experienced at Google this summer, that can be very exclusionist. And people sort of saying like, well, why are you giving privilege to this group? Or why did that group have privilege in the first place and so on. And so one of the things that I think is interesting about this is that you bring it back to the individual rather than the group. So can you talk a little bit about that, what the implications would be if we thought about diversity and inclusion in a different way? Sure. Um, so in fact, uh, I felt so bad for the situation that happened this summer because it was completely predictable that if you start doing, oh, we're going to try to include this group, it feels to the group on the other side of the teeter tot that power is being displaced, that they're being replaced. And if we're actually talking about a limited sum of the pie, then you understand why people are fighting over that pie. This model actually says something different, right? Which is that as you open up the opportunity, more opportunity exists, just like that Apple example. So let's just use a specific. There was a, in fact, you helped me find this story. So one of the stories in the book is a story of Fold It. Does anybody know this story by any chance? Okay cheater. She's read the book. And uh, <laughs> so Fold It is, a, is an online um, platform that was started um, based out of University of Washington. And they were trying to solve a, a problem in the biosciences space where um, if, if proteins f fold incorrectly, they basically cause disease, bottom line. And so things like Alzheimer's and stuff are all diseases caused by misfolded proteins. And they were realizing, this UW team, that every research team around the world was recreating the problem of how proteins were misfolding in order to do the actual research they wanted to do. And they thought, this is kind of silly. There ought to be like a repository you can draw on so that the foundational work is there and people can build on it, therefore accelerating the research. And they started an online app to basically crowd science this process. And at first, they thought their first step was, um, we're going to get PhDs from around the world, so think globalization talent, right? And that didn't turn out to have any breakthroughs at all. They let it run for almost a year. And so then they thought, eh, you know, maybe there's another way. What if we actually allow anyone, could we actually allow anyone, quite possibly everyone, to participate? Why don't we build a game that would teach you the fundamentals, like basically teaching how proteins fold, and then you can take it from there. And that created m more resolve. But then they realized, actually, they were sitting there watching the game and noticing that people were crowding around the people who had degrees from certain schools or that were men and not actually noticing who actually was good at the protein folding problem. And they could spot the difference because they themselves had actually, you know, they were studying it. And they just thought, what if we actually hide those social signals and just tune them down so that if you really want to know, you could know, but the focus is entirely on, oh, that's working better and people can notice that. That was one thing. And then the other thing they started to do was they actually just realized they were rewarding individuals instead of rewarding group work. So most work today is complex problem solving. Complex problem solving is not Obi sitting by herself or Nilla for sitting by herself. It's how we start to play off each other. And so then as soon as they change the reward system to be we all win together, if we all help each other go through this thing, they'd share in the credit. It changed how people actually responded and what they work. And then they created these like breakthroughs. So I think the problem is most of us have too many social signals in the way. 
And we're focusing on that instead of the work. And so I don't think about diversity and inclusion as I want, um, I want to go recruit X number of people. It's what problems do we have? And what is, the, what is the mechanism in place that would allow a whole bunch of people to come and play with that problem? So if I'm really practical, when I was um, doing consulting work, one of the things we would do is go in and um, uh, you know, we'd sign the contract with the company and say, we're going to come help you solve X problem. And this was typically after they had failed at it themselves and hired a BCG or McKinsey or whatever and failed at it with them. And then we were in the room and we would say, we're going to be in charge of the process. They would, of course, nod their head because, by the way, who wants to be in charge of the process? And completely signed off to that, right? Like, without a thought. And then the first day, we'd say, well, we're going to send out an email to anyone in the company, any, you know, like as broad of a group as possible, sometimes the entire company roster, and say, anybody who wants to come help us with this can come. And they would always have this, like, total look of panic go across their face. Like, I don't want the admin or the salesperson who's not happy or that, you know. Like, it's almost like the thought that was going through their head is, I don't want the crazy, and I'm putting that in air quotes for a reason, right? I don't want the crazy or the wild one in the room because we have a process to run. And I'm like, trust us, we'll actually get there. And as soon as you could have all that difference around the room and allow each difference to actually have their own voice, so create the space for that. So it could be sometimes we had post-its and let people have their ideas, and it turns out the post-its came from a person who had relatively low power. But as soon as you disassociated the power status to the idea, you could see the idea for what it was. Then all of a sudden, two, three, four weeks later, we'd have this breakthrough in the room, and it always, I mean, always, I say this universally, came from that crazy and wild person in the room. And so how do we do that then for all of our organizations? How do we actually start to go take down the signals, tune it down? So how do we recruit engineering people without knowing that they're a woman first, right? The data says that if we don't know that, we're more likely to use that person's code. So how do we just engineer more in the system a way to tune down social signals. And so that easy practical thing of using post-its in a room to generate ideas instead of going around the room because we're more likely to dismiss an idea based on power status would be an easy one. There's probably a hundred of those methods that could just be streamlined into the business that would allow us to actually see and contribute those ideas. As soon as you focus on the ideas and not on the person, I think we start to change things. Me too. And by the way, the best protein folder in their set was an admin assistant from Manchester, England. <laughs> so not Who, by the way, it's not, it's not irrelevant to this, given the, the climate of sexual harassment. She had left the industry because um, as a nurse, she had experienced so much sexism that she actually left the medical field. This is you know, a pattern that we've seen over and over again in recent weeks. If you read all the vignettes of the stories of people leaving Hollywood or people leaving tech, it's so much sexism just, you know, at some point you're like, okay, okay, I give up, I'll leave, I'll, I'll tone down my ambitions, I'll go to more female-oriented careers, and of course that's why women don't have as much power and status in industries. Questions? Really, we answered everything? <laughs> or are you guys just really shy? We have one here, too. I guess I have a question about unlocking the onlyness early on. By the way, so, what was your name again? Oh, sorry, I'm Bridget. Bridget. Um, if, you, you know, if most of the conversation has been centered around like your professional life, how can you catch this early on? So I'm thinking about my little sister who's in college, and when I went to visit her, I was disturbed again by the amount of Greek life and kind of like the group thing that centers around that and kind of like, how can I help her unlock her onlyness early on? That's my question. <laughs> Stay away from it. <laughs> have fun, but not too much. Like. Yeah, so it's, I think one of the things is early on in life, we're often trying to figure out how to fit in. So we're actually giving up ourselves along that process, and we're just doing it for basic survival, right? So in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom two levels are the food shelter things. The top two levels are about self-expression and self-actualization, which is where ideas come from. In the middle is this big block, the biggest block of the, of the thing, and it's belonging. So the question is, do we understand how to find people who care about the same things as us? Most of us are actually socialized to kind of look and say, OK, where are people already gathered? And then do we join in without much intentional thought about, that's not really my people, right? And so this question about who are we to one another is a question we need to learn to ask. Like, who am I in this mix? And then who are we to one another? And if you're asking yourself, gosh, I really don't feel like I belong here, maybe your sister really loves it, right? But to ask that and learn that skill about who am I, in relationship to this. And uh, I had a young entrepreneur who's um, 
I think she was like 20 something when she asked me this question. And she said she had gotten her PhD. Um, she taught, she's a very accomplished young entrepreneur, um, was a yoga fanatic and had a boyfriend that she was thinking about marrying. And she said, in order for me to decide what's next, which of these four things do I have to cut? Do I quit teaching? Do I quit doing my entrepreneurial stuff that my PhD is based on? Do I stop all my relationships because that's such a distraction? And should I quit yoga, yogi stuff because that's also a distraction? And I was like, well, why don't you do all four and live in the Venn diagram of everything that is you? And maybe because she was actually doing um, really cutting edge science stuff, which allows a cell to act like a heart and so on. So it's incredibly has really strong ethical implications for if you can grow things from nothing, right? Um, and I said, maybe it's your yogi sense that will actually help guide your ethical usage of this stuff because it will remind you how connected we are and what those decisions are. Maybe your relationship to your students will remind you that you're trying to teach the next generation about those same sets of ethical implications, not just the pure science of it, and so on. So maybe all of those things actually can belong together because she was really trying to figure out how to fit herself into a pigeonhole thing. So the greatest thing we can do is to actually notice all of the person and to say, um, you know, what you really seem to care about is X, Y, and Z and be that. Um, I like to say that most of us can't understand our own onlyness um, because we're living it. It's so obvious to everyone else what we care about but it's actually kind of hard because you're in the fuzz of it. You're, you're literally like mashed up against the glass of it, right? And so friends can say, this is you know, something that you care about. <laughs> like this, Obi totally gets me too. So I'm like waiting for her to tell me my onlyness for a second. But it's like a light bulb above your head. When you walk into a room, the whole room changes. So if that light bulb is um, tamarind orange versus neon orange, it's a different thing in that room. Or you know, mallard blue, right? And, so if your friends can say to you, this seems to be this thing you really care about, it helps reflect it back. And so maybe that's the one thing you can do for her is to help notice what is it that's so true to her history and experience as well as her visions and hopes, even something that's just uh, a thread she's ultimately going to pull on. Does that help? OK. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jason. Jason. Um, I, I noticed that one barrier for participation is is the ability to speak the language. For example, if you are in a room with a bunch of MBAs, and and if you don't have the background, you you can hardly really talk with them in in, in those all, you know all those jargons that they use. Same for engineers. If you are uh, not if you don't have computer science background, oftentimes you don't really know what they're talking about. And when you talk in your own language, and they, they can easily dismiss your yeah. ideas. Do you have any comment on that? No, it's, language is one of those invisible um, ways in which we group people. Absolutely, we use jargon to say we're in this industry in this way. And in fact, the UW team, that was one of their big insights. Um, it was uh, Adrian, I interviewed him here. He actually worked at Google X for a while. Um, and he said to me, we were sitting in a room with one of the top physicists in the world, and he used absolutely no jargon. And that's what gave him the clue to go from PhDs to go solve this problem to citizen science. That was the shift, is jargon was becoming the barrier to actually allowing people to innovate. It's one of the reasons why in the last five or so years, I actually use very little innovation jargon. I'm simplifying my own um, choices. And, and I'm doing that because I'm trying to make I'm trying to get past my own bullshit, right? And I mean that in the greatest, like we go through all this training to learn stuff, but sometimes you have to go, okay, I actually know that. So now how do I communicate it in a much simpler and more elegant way? So you've actually reached a really profound truth, which is most of the time, most of us are using jargon to say, I'm in this club. And that, and that can mean I'm educated and credentialed. It can mean I'm an engineer and not one of you marketing people that doesn't talk this way, right? And my husband's a chip designer, and I'm fascinated when I read his resume because I don't understand most of it. And he asked me for some help recently in looking at it, and I was like, well, I can give you like the, the gist of it, you know, like if the sentence structure's right or if like the main idea's popping out, but I can't really talk to you about anything else. You might want to have somebody else do that part. But I was realizing like we do this thing where we create separations, partially to say this is the club I'm in. And the question is when we're talking in meetings then, maybe we could actually kind of find a way to tone down the jargon. And you can even say that, right? 
hey, jargon might be getting in the way for us finding a breakthrough idea, so why don't we just figure out how to dial it down? Which is why that posted example, and I could probably give you another 100 examples, like that can be the way to get past language choices. It's intentionality. It's intentionality. It's a great question. Um, hi, my name is Ada. Um, I can only imagine Like Ada the, Lovelace? Uh, yeah, or, okay. yeah, people say that. <laughs> I, I'm not named after that. I'm more about the palindrome because my mom's name is Anna, which is also a palindrome. I don't know where she got that idea from. Um, anyway. Um, well, there's an onlyness story there. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah, totally. Yes. Uh, I can only imagine the courage you had to have um, in order to speak in that room of people who won't even give you eye contact um, as a... Asian women that myself like that at first my English wasn't even smooth enough and going into the room with people taller and bigger male guy I have often had that experience and um, <clears throat> sometimes I really try to fit in in order to make someone like notice like I'm here and actually here I'm curious like from your experience like how do you give courage in that moment and how do you even make your voice heard because I'm actually believe that you need to kind of make yourself belong. Then you take a step back and show that, by the way, I also have this uniqueness. Yeah. But I don't know, maybe there is another way to do it. This is the tension of how do we belong to a group that we have to influence and also assert our own ideas. So one way is to actually have an invisible network always there with you. So there's a group of uh, people that you have to get along with, but you can actually build an invisible network of people in the room with you. So for example, um, I belong to, uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the book, if you get to um, uh, chapter four, this group called The List. And it was a group of women started uh, um, trying to figure out how to change the women ratio on stages and boardrooms, et cetera. Um, entrepreneurial settings. And so um, the, it was a private list, and so you'd ask questions like, one of my favorite ones was, so this one VC always smells my hair, should I worry about the smelling of the hair? And other people shared, actually that guy smells everyone's hair, it's genderless, that guy has a hair fetish. And so it's the weirdest thing to discover, but it became the whisper network um, made visible, right? So then all of us were starting to share stories about what was working in venture funding, who was doing what. It became the back channel. So at any given point, I could be in a meeting saying, I'm experiencing this, anyone have ideas? And honest to God, within a couple seconds, someone would be like, why don't you try this? And it would become this, there's, there's this invisible group of 499 other people who are available on call through texting to be able to help me get through my situation. And it could be here, you might end up choosing five people who are often in that room or in that setting on your team and say, hey, could we actually figure out how to help each other more, be more intentional about helping each other's ideas get promoted? So maybe if somebody else is in the room with you, they could say, you know what Ada just said is really worth expanding on so that people then draw more attention back to your idea if she felt it was like getting skipped over because of that, you could find ways of building a network despite the room that you have to be in. Does that make sense? So it's an intentionality of design of who else could join you, whether they're in the room or not, and um, figuring out how to have that set of resources available to you. That ends up improving your social standing because now you don't get to feel like the weirdo in the room because at any given point you have a posse invisible to the room that has always got your back and as long as you have that social standing, you have more confidence going in. And you know, I ended up leaving home that day, but I showed up on community college campus the next day. And literally, I walked down to the financial aid office. I knew the guy who happened to run the financial aid office and said, so this just happened. And he said, oh. And he literally took me by my hand and he walked me around the campus. And he convinced three people to give me jobs. One was a coding job, one was an usher job, one was an accounting job. The usher job I could do Saturday nights, so I could still study. The uh, accounting job was a Friday afternoon job where once a week I would sit there and do the history museum on campus accounting. And the other job I could do basic coding to ultimately build a matriculation program. I could do it flexible hours. So between classes I could show up and do an hour worth of work here and there. I literally pieced together in that one afternoon viability. But this person wanted me to have an education. So my family did not because they saw me through one lens, but this person belong to a different group, right? He believed in the same thing I believed, which is that a woman, despite her, I mean, a person, despite her gender, 
can have an education and here is something he could do to come lend support. And as soon as you end up walking away from the people who don't believe in you, that you actually don't belong to in any kind of real way, you will ultimately find the people to whom and with whom you do belong. That walkway, that gangplank is treacherous. Like you feel like you're gonna end up nowhere, but you ultimately do get there. So that's what I think gives me courage too, is studying all that and seeing that every single one of the 300 stories had to walk the gangplank. And then they ended up with a group of people who actually believed in them and could stand with them. Hi, I had a question, but it turned out to be a comment now. Uh, so thank you for the topic. Uh, I think I, I have, I'm a new, new to Google, and I think I sometimes experience some of the things that you talked about. But I think the heart of it, I think what these people have been asking is, how do you create your credibility in front of those people who you're looking for? It is not necessarily about you know the la how much how much language barriers you have and whatnot. I think what you're trying to say is, okay, how am I make some how how can I be more credi credible to this audience who have who are who are establishing their own credibility with 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 the, with their MBA degrees and whatnot. Yeah. And the second point I want to make 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 is I think what you just explained in the, in the previous question was about the heart of it. You are trying to look for mentors who can guide you through this process. And, and it's still, at the end of the day, you still have to walk that path to make yourself, credit, you know, establish your credibility for, for these people or the group you're trying to, to, to work with. Yeah. It's a beautiful set of reflections. What was your name, by the way? Abhijit. Abhijit? Abhijit. Abhijit. Um, so so one, one little, um, sorry, your first one. Go back to it for a second. It was credibility, right? We're trying to establish credibility. Most of us have been conditioned to believe that the outside world gets to identify for us whether or not we have value to add. This is a different thing to do, which is to believe that you already have something to add. You already have some value to give. And so that first step is, how do we conceive of ourselves in such a way that we understand, even if we're not educated or we're poor or whatever, that we have value to offer and, and tilt the system and then say, as I value myself, I will get valued. So just standing in that truth is probably the, the biggest step. Because I mean, I do this all the time. I, I, had, uh, I was just emailing with a girlfriend and, uh, and saying I'm having a really hard time with some of the, the speaking work I'm doing. Because she said, well, what you're trying to say is this is the biggest management idea ever, right? Which is if we're going to be able to create ideas out of people and that's the entire economy. What you're saying is, onlyness is the biggest management idea ever because as you lead people and recognize their individuality, you will actually create the kinds of teams, organizations, blah, 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 that will actually create outcomes. That is a huge idea. And I wrote back to her and I said, yeah, that's really easy if you say it. But by the way, the whole world hasn't said it yet. So for me to assert that as a truth feels crazy. For you to assert that as a truth does not. And then I shut the computer and I went, yeah, so I'm having a hard time owning my onlyness, right? Totally, it's this, it's this weird thing because what I'm waiting for is some credentialed moment to say, you're allowed to claim something as an idea. And I, so, so it's, just a, it's just a flip to actually say, I, I can, I can actually claim that. And there's enough data in the system, there's enough signals in the system to say that's, it's based on evidence, the research has been done, the social science behind it backs it, right? I, but I still can't make myself say it. Does that make sense? So I understand what you're talking about, about influence, but the first step is about how do you conceive of yourself because it changes the value equation. So I think actually for those of us who have children, that's probably the biggest gift we can give our kids is to not have expectations of what they're going to do, but just give them the confidence that whatever they choose to do, they can do. So Yeah. Right, we have time for one more question. Who wants to bring it home? One more, okay. Otherwise, we're gonna end it on that. And thank you so much for coming in, Nilifer. Thanks, Thank Abby. you for those of you who joined us on the live stream. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for such a great conversation. <laughs>